So good afternoon. Today we're going to share an update on our community health centers uh, who are supporting many of our efforts in response to COVID-19. But first I want to take a quick update on testing and hospitalization, which I think as most people know uh, are some of the key metrics we're paying a lot of attention to. Yesterday almost 12,000 tests were reported, a big number that was double the previous day's total which brings our total number of tested, tests conducted in the Commonwealth to over 350,000. Of the tests reported yesterday, 14% were positive for COVID-19. That percentage is much more in line with the trend that we've been seeing over the past week, where the percent of cases that are positive has been lower than pretty much anything we saw in April. As I've said before, test results are one of the key indicators that we monitor closely. And we need to remember that those results depend a lot on who does get tested. No single day is indicative of a trend. Data trends have to be looked at over time and are crucial to our conversations about how soon we can start the process of reopening. That's why it's important to not draw too many conclusions from one day's data. Other data points we pay close attention to are the number of COVID-19 hospitalizations, the rate of hospitalizations among all COVID-19 cases, and the amount of COVID cases in intensive care units. There are currently 3,436 patients hospitalized in Massachusetts from COVID-19. That represents a reduction of about 126 patients compared to the previous day. There are approximately 850 COVID-19 patients currently in intensive care units. And I would just add that the intensive care unit capacity in Massachusetts is significantly above today what it would normally be, but that's because we worked with the hospital community to build additional so-called surge capacity in their ICUs to be able to manage the increase in COVID cases, which has turned out um, to be a pretty effective strategy in ensuring that our hospitals could do that as well as continue to serve people who are dealing with other health care conditions and circumstances as well. Over the past week, we have seen a steady reduction in hospitalizations. There are 280 fewer hospitalizations for COVID-19 patients than there were last Friday. Overall, about 5% of cases, which is a pretty consistent number, have been hospitalized. We're making progress here, but I want to remind everybody that the virus spreads quickly and continues to impact, based on our testing data, thousands of people across the Commonwealth. And while we'd like to see the drop come just as quickly as possible, it's not going to happen all at once as the data shows. We've seen progress and we'll continue to see progress as long as everybody continues to do their part. Another way we're continuing to push back against the virus is to pursue more personal protective equipment or PPE. This includes masks, gowns, gloves, ventilators and other gear for first responders, emergency management personnel, healthcare workers, and nursing home workers. As of yesterday, we've distributed over 9.2 million pieces of PPE, basically in the past 40 days, to hospitals, nursing homes, community health centers, cities and towns, and first responders across the Commonwealth. Overall, this week showed us some encouraging trends when it comes to our fight against the virus. And we know that everyone is anxious, and so are we, to move forward on bringing back the economy. And we all hope that we'll be able to start to take some of those steps soon. But at the same time, we did see individual days this week where the fluctuations in the data were less encouraging. That underscores the fact that the reopening process won't be instantaneous and will probably be done in an appropriately planned and phased-in way. There's no way you can just flip a switch and doing so all at once could almost guarantee that we would have a huge spike in infections and more fatalities, the exact result we are seeking to avoid. Instead, we need to see the numbers continue to improve and to see that curve gradually slope downward. That will enable us to begin the phased approach to reopening that we've been talking about in the past few weeks. And even still, there will be bumps along the way after that. We're likely going to be dealing with outbreaks until things like vaccines and treatments catch up with this virus. We certainly expect that will happen. We have some of the smartest people in the world right here in Massachusetts that are making real progress on both treatments and vaccines, but that will take time. We need to stay committed to the fight because if we let up now, we risk losing all the progress that we've made. 
Which brings me to the community health centers. Some of our most crucial partners in the fight against COVID-19 have been the folks who work and manage our community health centers here in Massachusetts. Today we're joined by Eliza Lake, who's the CEO of Hilltown Community Health Center in Western Massachusetts. Eliza is here to discuss what community health centers have experienced during the COVID-19 crisis, and she'll share an important message to patients who need medical care. And as we said before, we deeply value the role of community health centers. They're firmly rooted in the neighborhoods they serve, and they play an important role in facilitating access to care and reducing and eliminating health care disparities. That's why we've been proactive about partnering with community health centers in this fight against COVID-19. Last week, we announced that we had expanded our testing partnership with Quest Diagnostics and 18 community health centers throughout the Commonwealth. That partnership is specifically focused on increasing testing in many of our hardest hit areas, including high density communities and communities of color. We recognize that many of these places continue to be hotspots for the virus, including neighborhoods in Boston, Worcester, Springfield, and municipalities like Chelsea, Brockton, Lawrence, Lowell, Revere, and Holyoke. Our COVID-19 Response Command Center continues to partner with the leadership in these communities to support a robust response to the virus. And the increased testing throughout the community health center system is a key part of that overall effort. Community health centers have always played a critical role in all Massachusetts communities in delivering health care. For example, Hilltown Community Health Centers has five sites offering a wide range of health services for communities across Western Mass. In a few minutes, Eliza will talk a little more about the terrific work that's being done by the team at Hilltown to support the residents of these communities during the crisis. And today we're here to help our community health centers make sure people know that they're open for business during this pandemic. The Mass League of Community Health Centers is launching a public awareness campaign called New Tools, New Rules, Same Great Care. This public awareness campaign will consist of TV and digital ads and has a very simple message. Community health centers are open during this crisis and people should come in for the care that they need. The campaign makes clear that patients should continue to seek care for their medical conditions like asthma and diabetes at their local community health centers or their physician's offices. We know that these medical needs don't stop when the COVID-19 crisis begins. A few weeks ago, we had representatives from the hospitals throughout the Commonwealth join us here to encourage people to continue to call their doctor and to talk about their health care needs and to go to the hospital if they had an emergency. And believe it or not, after some of those engagements, those conversations, and those PSAs, people did start, in fact, to return. And at this point in time, in many of the conversations we have with our colleagues in the hospital community, they've indicated that slowly, but surely they have seen people start to come back. Just like the hospitals, the community health centers have implemented measures to ensure that they remain safe and ready to care for all medical conditions. Community health centers have also worked hard to set up telehealth services so people can more easily connect with their health care provider. Simply put, and we've said this many times before, we plan for this, we are able to deal with it, we have the capacity, we do not want people getting sicker or exacerbating an illness or an injury because they're concerned about the healthcare system's ability to support them. It's important that people are cared for when they're sick, whether that's for COVID-19 or for so many other medical problems. The medical and health professionals who staff our community health centers are ready to serve and help patients who need care. I'd now like to turn it over to Eliza Lake, who can talk a little bit more about the work that she and her team at Hilltown are doing to respond to COVID-19 and how their facilities are open and ready to serve all the patients who need their support. Eliza? Good afternoon, and, and thank you, Governor Baker, for the opportunity to speak about community health centers' work to maintain access to important health care services. I'm especially honored to speak about our commitment to mental health as we are currently observing Mental Health Month and the role of telehealth in meeting people's mental health needs. 
In the early weeks of this public health crisis, community health centers across Massachusetts acted rapidly, curtailing many services in order to keep our communities safe and in response to public health directives. We transformed very quickly from primary care settings to urgent care centers, redesigning our sites and our work to meet the need of the moment. Over a matter of days in March, Hilltown Community Health Center's staff created new processes, new teams, and new ways of caring for our patients. For every decision, we balanced patient and public safety with access to care for our vulnerable communities. HCHC staff maintained a focus on both COVID and non-COVID needs, on physical and mental health, and on the social determinants of health that affect both. I know that my colleagues across the state showed similar dedication and commitment to their missions, despite the incredible uncertainty of that time. These changes to practice and the significant decreases in visits across all services came with an impact on health centers' financial stability. The health centers were already struggling with workforce challenges before the crisis, but this challenge has been compounded by reductions in available staffing due to caregiving responsibilities or by a need to protect vulnerable family members from infection. Telehealth, therefore, has been a critical piece of our overall response. It has been a vital strategy, both in caring for our patients and in helping to address some of the health center's financial distress due to their response to the crisis. Telehealth has been particularly helpful in making sure that our patients who were receiving behavioral health care before the COVID outbreak can continue to receive it. It is providing us with the ability to meet an increase in demand for these services, an unsurprising outcome of the pandemic. I want to express my and my colleagues' thanks to Governor Baker, Lieutenant Governor Polito, Secretary Sutters, and the team at MassHealth for making a decision very early on to reimburse behavioral health and other important primary care services that we provide through telehealth. We really appreciate your foresight and quick action. We appreciate it at Hilltown Community Health Center because we have seen the growing needs that telehealth can address and how it expanded patients' access to mental health. We serve a rural region that has no public transportation system, so patients who struggled to make their in-person therapy appointments before are now better able to access the support they need. We do not yet have high-speed internet in all of our small towns, so being able to meet with patients over the phone has enabled almost everyone to talk to their therapist when they need to. We have been able to extend our services from the usual office with comfortable chairs to something that works for the patient. It certainly isn't always ideal. Our therapists have described having telehealth sessions with a man sitting in his car parked to the public hotspot so he could have a video visit, a teenager who drove to the top of the hill to get better cell phone coverage, or a patient who went to a small shed with her cell phone as it was the best place to find some privacy from a large family. Telehealth, Telehealth is allowing us to meet their needs flexibly on their schedule and in their place. Statewide, all health centers have worked very hard to successfully ramp up their telehealth capacity and are excited to do more. The Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers and our statewide accountable care organization, Community Care Cooperative, or C3, continue to collaborate on expanding the capacity of health center providers and patients to participate in telehealth services. C3 was recently awarded several grants, including from local family foundations and a federal grant devoted to telehealth capacity. These funds are not only helping us today, but are also being used to assist health centers in implementing telehealth in a manner that is sustainable for the long term. Telehealth will help us increase access while addressing other long-standing problems, such as provider recruitment and retention. It will allow us to collaborate with health centers across the state so that we can pool our clinical resources, enhancing patient access and reducing barriers to care. For instance, a few community health centers are already sharing behavioral health clinical resources like psychiatry via telehealth. We are excited about the potential telehealth holds for the future. I want to um, echo the governor's remarks about reminding people that in community, that the communi- people in need, the community health centers are here and ready to take care of you. Although some of the rules and tools around how you access that care have changed, it's still the same high-quality care that you have come to expect. Make sure to call us first so that we can figure out the best kind of appointment for your particular health need, whether that be in person or through telehealth. I also want to thank Governor Baker and Secretary Sutters and Lieutenant Governor Polito for the financial and regulatory assistance you have provided to the health center network over the last couple of months. 
This essential temporary relief has allowed us to maintain access to care for health center patients during this crisis and also gives us hope that we will be here long after it is over as partners in the Commonwealth's collective recovery. Our behavioral health staff certainly have moments of being worried and fearful for their clients who faced extraordinary stressors in their lives even before this crisis. But they are also so grateful to be able to provide support during this terrible time, and our patients are deeply grateful that it is possible. Thank you. And now Secretary Sutters. Thank you. Good afternoon. Thank you, Governor, Lieutenant Governor, and Eliza. Thank you for coming in from Worthington uh, to be with us today. Um, I'm so grateful to you and your colleagues in the healthcare system for providing health care, including behavioral health care, during these times. Uh, as we have often said here, uh, taking care of oneself both behaviorally and physically is very important. As the governor noted the Mass in Eliza, the Massachusetts League of Community Health Centers has launched the campaign New Tools, New Rules, Same Great Care to encourage all residents to continue to take care of their health, both physical and mental health. As you heard, the community health centers stepped up during this pandemic to really provide telehealth and video appointments and have strong health safety protocols for in-person visits. The new tools, new rules, same great care campaign features patients that represent the diversity of our state with common conditions such as asthma, diabetes, and pregnancy. The message is upbeat and clear. Don't be afraid. Get the care you need. The campaign consists of television and social media ads. The ads are generously being run for free by WCVB Channel 5 in the greater Boston area and WWLP 22 News and the CW Springfield in Western Mass. The ads in English, Spanish, and other languages are targeted specifically to the communities and zip codes with concentrations of low-income residents. It is important to not delay seeking urgent treatment, either in person or through telehealth. There is no question that telehealth has expanded exponentially as a result of this pandemic. Many of us have become comfortable using popular apps such as FaceTime, Zoom, or Skype to video chat with our loved ones. So it shouldn't be that difficult to make the leap of having a video treatment appointment with your primary care provider. And under Governor, one of Governor Baker's executive orders, health plans are required to reimburse health care for telehealth at the same rate as for in-person office visits. The Mass League of Community Health Centers surveyed their members and found that many of the health centers have stepped up to provide care through telehealth, as you've heard including ensuring that providing long-term behavioral health care that started pre-pandemic continues through telehealth. And in fact, the health centers report that just from January to April, the total telehealth visits for medical services grew from 506 to more than 83,000. And for, 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 I really can talk, for behavioral health, grew from 517 visits to 22,000. MassHealth began, began covering telehealth services in mid-March, including services provided both over the phone or live, or live video for all medically necessary and clinically appropriate care. There have been more than 600,000 telehealth visits in MassHealth since March. We also con contracted with three telehealth providers to further support members with questions about symptoms that may be related to COVID-19. You, you connect those through the Bowie app, Bowie app. And we've made it available for people who do not have insurance. It's very important. We encourage patients to get the care they need and to strongly consider using telehealth services as a real safe option taking care of the ongoing health needs of our most vulnerable residents, keep them healthier, and may reduce the number who need emergency room services or hospitalization. Thank you. Governor. Questions? Governor, can I ask you about an announcement Mayor Walsh made that yeah. uh, he thinks uh, there should be no festivals, parades of any sort all summer through Labor Day. Is that something you could see happening on a statewide level? Well, obviously, we'll be talking to our colleagues in local government about decisions like that. 
but you know, the Lieutenant Governor and I have both marched in a lot of parades in the city of Boston uh, over the course, for me anyway, of the past 10 years. And uh, it would be hard for me to imagine, um, given how popular those parades are, how you would ever deliver on a social distancing um, standard for one of those. I mean, those are usually, you know, shoulder to shoulder, four or five deep, sometimes more. Um, and they stretch two or three miles. Um, so I certainly understand why he thinks it would be important uh, for us to get a little more ground between us and, uh, and the coronavirus before something like that um, were to take place. I, I think, I, I've said this before, I think one of the biggest challenges, um, not just we, but everybody everywhere, is going to have when it comes to dealing with coronavirus once you get past the surge and, and start to develop some sort of um, new normal is how do you deal with those big shoulder to shoulder, you know, massive humanity events. Um, they are exactly the opposite of what we've all been delivering on for the past few months in terms of guidance and, uh, and advisories and policies. Does this have the makings of the summer that wasn't you know, um, I think I think the I think the most interesting sort of positive thing I can say about all this, and there aren't many, is that uh, people have come up with creative and unusual ways uh, to share ideas, to share stories, and to share themselves with one another through means other than those that they've traditionally pursued. And, you know, the commentary that Eliza and Secretary Sutters both talked about with respect to the rise of telehealth in Massachusetts. Um, telehealth was invented in Massachusetts um, almost 20 years ago. And uh, it's never been legal here. Um, not legal in the sense that it's a covered benefit the way it is in so many other places. And uh, you talk to almost anybody in the provider community and people on the payer side, and they'll tell you that the combination of the arrival of the coronavirus and the executive emergency order that we issued on telehealth has brought this into the mainstream in Massachusetts as a legitimate way for clinicians to support and provide services uh, to their patients that simply didn't exist before. And my guess, my expectation is However, we're playing within the framework of what's possible under um, COVID-19, people will come up with interesting ways um, to spend their time and, and to stay in touch. It won't be, in many cases, it won't be the old familiar way they did it, but, you know, people adapt. And I think sometimes we underestimate them with respect to that. But it will definitely be a different kind of summer. Yeah. I think um, I think churches are coming to see you soon, aren't they? Tomorrow. Okay. Um, I think I am very interested in hearing what comes from the conversations that um, the religious community has with uh, with the reopening advisory board. I. Um, I said from the beginning that um, one of the most uh, difficult elements of that gathering order, uh, which limited gatherings to 10 or less, was the impact it had on people's ability to practice their faith. Um, but that said, there's plenty of evidence from around the world that in places where people didn't do that, um, religious gatherings became a really big hotbed and a hotspot of outbreak. So... Whatever we do here, and that's part of the reason why I'm anxious to hear what they have to say, is we have to do that as safely as we can, working collaboratively with our colleagues in the religious community to ensure that um, it's not a short-term thing. Well, whatever happens here, whenever that happens, we'd want it to be something that is sustainable over time. And remember, a lot of the folks, I mean, a lot of the folks who, um, who practice their faith are older. I mean, there's a lot of young people too, but I can't remember the last time I went to a, 
a service in a temple or a mosque or a church or a cathedral where um, a significant portion of the population uh, wasn't under the age of, were over the age of 50. And um, that's exactly the community in many respects that um, we need to pay attention to. Yep. So the, the summer camp stuff and the child care stuff is the source of daily discussion between people in our administration and folks who um, operate those programs. And, and by the way, those are also practically daily conversations between me and governors in other states who are wrestling with the same questions and uh, the chiefs of staffs who are talking to each other as part of that Northeast Coalition. Th these issues are, are hard and the way I would describe them um, would be to say that I think everybody who's talking about this would like to figure out a way to do it and to do it as safely as it can be done. The tough part is figuring out, especially when it comes to some of the stuff that involves um, the joys of being a kid, figuring out some way to do this where um, you have at least enough rules to make sure it can be done safely, but you don't destroy the whole spontaneous nature of what those are supposed to be about. But these are, I mean, I've probably talked to 20 governors in the past two days, three days, on various calls. These two issues have come up on every single call, and I always end it by saying, so which one of, you's act which one of you actually has the plan that I can read, right? And the answer is, we're not quite there yet, and that's exactly where we are as well. But we get how important this is, not just, and it's not just important for people's ability to work, it's important for, you know, getting back to, um, to Steve's point, this is one of those things that makes kids kids, and we get that. Sure, yeah, there, I mean, um, I think there's 12,000 um, kids worth of capacity there. It's never got anywhere near that level, uh, and they've worked quite well. Governor, what do you make of the uh, rules for gun sellers to reopen that uh, Judge Woodlock put in his order, and have they gotten a seat uh, to, to pitch the advisory board? Um, okay, so I'm under the impression he has spoken about what was going to be in his order, but he hasn't actually issued his order. I think there was a, an order issued yesterday, right? I don't about, think so. About um, they would be reopening at noon tomorrow, uh, four appointments per hour, up to 12 people in a store at a time. Is that not in? I, so, okay, okay, my lawyers told me he hadn't actually, he had spoken to what was going to be in his order, but he hasn't actually issued it yet. So my, 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 it could be that my folks are wrong and you're right. The bottom line is we're just going to comply with whatever, whatever he says. Governor, there were some eye-popping unemployment numbers released for the nation. Yep. The rest the depression. Um, do you think Massachusetts is in a better spot than the rest of the country, and are you optimistic about the economy over the next two years returning? Um, I guess I would say two things about that. The first is... People have worked enormously hard here to get folks the benefits they're entitled to. Uh, we're one of, we were one of the first 10 states to stand up um, an unemployment assistance program for uh, people who weren't part of the traditional unemployment system. And at this point in time, I think there are still less than half the states in the country that have actually figured out how to get people money into those programs. Um, we've also, every single day except Easter, there's been a town hall in more than one language uh, that hundreds of thousands of people in Massachusetts have participated in um, to work their way through the traditional system. And at this point in time, um, you know, literally 500,000 plus people in Massachusetts are collecting unemployment under the traditional program in addition to the couple of hundred thousand that are getting it through the pandemic program. Um, so I guess what I would say is I think we've done... Um, a decent job of moving as quickly as we could to help folks who lost their jobs through no fault of their own get the benefits that they're entitled to. Um, but I would say that the state of the economy generally 
as a result of the COVID-19 and coronavirus outbreak um, is really, really um, on the edge. And, um, and that's part of the reason why, if we continue to see positive movement and downward trends on the issues we've talked about here before, we're going to try and develop a set of safe ways to begin to phase in uh, a reopening. But you can't look at the numbers that are out there and conclude anything other than um, not just here, but in many places in Europe and around the world, um, this pandemic has not only been a public health uh, outbreak and crisis, but it's been an incredible gut punch to the economy and to the people who work in virtually every country it's affected, including ours. There's a long conversation going on right now between the public health folks and the folks at DESE and some of the folks, um, some of the school superintendents um, around what might be doable with regard to graduation. Um, but I would certainly hope Plymouth would wait until a bunch of folks who know what they're talking about can help them think about how to do this in a way that's safe. I guess that would be my message. It's a matter of days, okay, between where they are and where we are. And, um, and in some issues, um, we're being told uh, that we're actually ahead of those states on certain things and that they're ahead of us on others. I honestly, I said yesterday that my view on this is that we should talk to as many of our colleagues in the Northeast and in other like states as we possibly can to get the best ideas and the best advice and the best guidance we can from our own folks and from them and from their folks, and then try to make decisions that don't create so much confusion between and among people who are located in similar areas that nobody can figure out what the rules are. Um, but I don't expect everybody to move in lockstep because everybody's not in the same place. I mean, if you look at the, if you look at the data on a state-by-state -state basis, um, Roughly 11 states uh, make up about 80% of all the COVID-19 deaths and cases in the country. Um, 40 states, I'm, using, I'm counting the Washington, D.C., that's why I get to 51. 40 states represent about 20%, and, um, and, and we're, we're not all in the same place. And you wouldn't expect if we weren't all in the same place that we would all move in exactly the same way or deal with these issues the same way. But we do talk a lot, and those of us who are in the Northeast talk all the time because we don't want to do things that create difficulty for our neighbors, and our neighbors don't want to do things that create difficulty for us. And this, this summer camp question is a good example of that. I mean, we're all struggling with it. We would all like to figure out how to do it, it's one of those issues that we all share a common interest in trying to find a way to move forward. Um, and if another state comes up with a, a really interesting way of doing this that the rest of us think can work, um, we'll pursue it that way. But, but the fact that we're not, on all, we're not all on exactly the same time frame, a lot of that just has to do with you know, the so-called facts on the ground. Um, the numbers in Massachusetts look a lot different than they do in some of our surrounding states. Some cases better and in some cases worse. Can you let Bruce? Yeah. We've done some, um, I mean, that's obviously something that usually requires collaboration and cooperation between us and the, and the locals. We've done it in a bunch of different places over the course of the past um, five or six weeks. And, um, and it continues to be something that 
we talk to our colleagues in local government about. Sometimes it's our road, sometimes it's, uh, it's their road, but those are things we have done and we'll continue to talk to people about. I, I guess if, if folks have, have people done this like on a permanent change, like they've changed it completely from ever being a road to becoming something other than that, or is this more sort of, you know, try it out, see how it works? Well, I think it's always the latter starting. With yeah. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, <laughs> there are a lot of conversations that are going on like that, and uh, we'll come back and, and share some of our thoughts on that. Governor, could you? Oh, sorry. Steve? Go ahead. Sorry, I just wanted to see if uh, Eliza Lake could speak to the uh, what the financial hit looks like, what the caseload looks like, maybe compared to pre-COVID, just to get a sense of what uh, what types of patients are not being seen right now, or what types of illnesses are not being treated as much as before. Um. Well, I think the primary message is to reiterate what this campaign is talking about, which is we need people with chronic disease uh, who need constant management to keep coming in. We've been doing our work to reach out to them to make sure that they're coming in. Um, we have seen, uh, certainly in, you know, we, we provide a range of services. So in dental and optometry, um, we've, you know, had to reduce ourselves down to urgent visits only, has gone down to about 10, 15, 20 percent of normal visits. Um, in medical and behavioral health, because we've been able to tra tra transition to a telehealth quickly, uh, behavioral health, I believe, in, in most community health centers has gotten back almost to the same volume as it had been. Um, and medical, obviously, is still severely impacted, but we are working very hard to get the message out that people should be getting in touch with us. And whether those visits are telehealth or in person, um, we don't want anyone to be neglecting their care as, as a result of this situation. Governor, can I ask you about the um, cancellation of the Boston Pops this year? A lot of people look forward to the fireworks. And yeah. I guess the concert will go on on tape, but it won't be quite the same. No, it won't be. Um, I, uh, I've gone to it um, in my current job. I also went to it when my kids were younger, and we just sort of hung out on the grass and, and enjoyed it. Um, and we've actually watched it from both sides of the, of the river. It's actually, it's actually kind of interesting to watch it on the Cambridge side. Um, I think the, um, that's a really good example of something that um, won't happen this year, but I fully expect that people will come up with other ways of celebrating uh, our nation's birthday. And, um, and I, I, do think, I do think we need to remember that there are a lot of really creative people, not just here in Massachusetts, but all over the place. And, uh, and they are constantly coming up with interesting ways um, to celebrate or communicate around a particular event that's been lost or, um, or a particular moment that they want to recognize but they can't recognize in the way they have before. And, um, and that is, in fact, just kind of the way it's going to be for the time being. And I do believe that the, that kind of a gathering especially since a lot of the folks who show up at that event um, aren't from Boston. They come from all over the place. Um, it's, a, it's a much harder event, like many of the others, the parades, for example, to actually create any kind of structure around how you could live up to some of the requirements with respect to distance and, um, and sort of safe public gathering. So uh, I, do, I, I fully expect people will come up with some interesting ways to celebrate the 4th. Most of them will end up on social media, and a lot of us will have a chance to enjoy them one at a time as opposed to in one big event. Governor, have you spoken to uh, Mayor Walsh about uh, possibly easing and allowable construction? There's been a lot of back and forth between, um, between us and uh, the city and us and other communities around construction generally. And um, I think they also came in and met with the advisory board, didn't they? Yeah, this is one of those issues that's pretty top of mind and will certainly be dealt with when they issue their report. Thank you. Finally, it's going to be rain tomorrow. Any movie tips? You had one last week. It was good. It was a good 
Good review. But you think I got a good review yeah, on that one, Steve? Yeah. Well, that one. So um, it's going to be rainy tomorrow, so maybe if you have two. Or, All right, or so, a so here's, here's sort of a, there's a show that used to run on the BBC that's called Bailey and Scott, and it's sort of the British TV version of Cagney and Lacey, and it's great. <laughs> Thank you. I got uh, three thumbs up on the biggest little farm, by the way. Thank you.